just me on the cross he sealed my heart he sealed my pardon made the dead and made me free and made me free Sing, oh, sing, oh, my Redeemer, sing, oh, sing, oh, my Redeemer, with his blood he purchased me, he purchased me, he purchased me, on the cross he sealed my part, he sealed my part, and paid the debt and made me free, and made me free, and made me free. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer, sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer, with his blood he purchased me, with his blood he purchased me, on the cross he sealed my pardon, on the cross he sealed my pardon, made the dead and made me free and made me free and made me Good morning on this beautiful Sunday morning. Aren't we glad to be in God's house this morning? Is God still alive and well? Is God working in your life? Amen. Have you been adopted into the family of God today? Well, let's sing about it. Let's stand and sing hymn number 386, The Family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. Let's sing that again from our voice to God's ears. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Amen. I've been washed in the fount. Hallelujah. Cleansed by his blood. Can I get a witness? Join us with Jesus as we travel this song. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. Amen and amen. I pray that you can say today you've been adopted into the family of God. Amen. Hallelujah. That Jesus gave his life on that cross that we could be adopted, that we could be called children of God. Amen. amen. All right, let's remain standing as we sing one of my favorite hymns, Love Lifted Me, hymn 546. The words will be on the screen. Let's sing. Far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But then the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted even me, love lifted even me.
lands live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true merits my soul's best songs. Faithful, loving service to, to him belongs. Love lifted even me, love lifted even me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted even me, love lifted even me, when nothing else could help. completely saves he will lift you by his love out of the angry ways praise God he's the master of the sea billows his will obey he your savior wants to be be saved today love lifted even me love lifted even me when nothing else could help be seated. Whew. All right. Brother, got him warmed up. Amen. 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 Oh, we have so much to be thankful for on this beautiful Lord's Day. Amen. 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 The great privilege we have of gathering ourselves together in the name of Jesus Christ. Praise God. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. And as somebody, it's better to be the house of God. Amen. But when we all get together, it makes a big difference. We got a lot of thanks uh, this morning. And one is uh, answered prayer from Ms. Ella uh, Claire. She has uh, come home, little baby of Jennifer Painter and Ben. Uh, some of you may know them out here, wise. And uh, so she's at home now from the hospital. And that's because God answered your prayers and uh, got her where she can't come home. And I uh, want to thank God this morning for taking care of Tony. Tony is out of the hospital. He's here at church this morning, and God's looking after him. He's answering our prayers for Tony. And then uh, it's good to see Harry here this morning. God has really worked in Harry's life. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, we miss Harry, man. I tell you what. <laughs> Y'all know why they call him Harry, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. And it's good to see Brother, I got you, Brother, amen. And uh, it's good to see Brother Donald Wimbro here this morning, too. Donald's been battling some uh, sinus infection, but the Lord's got him, got him here in church this morning. It's good to be with the people of God this morning, amen. And we, we, all we can do this morning is praise him, right? We can thank him for what he's already done, and we're going to ask him to do some other things as well. We're going to ask Jesus this morning through our prayers. But this morning... Uh, as we prepare and go to a time of prayer, I want you to just think in your heart, then consider yourself and your life, and uh, is your life a life that's committed to God? Is, are you truly saved? Have you been born again? Uh, have you died to self? Are you living for God? And, you know, we'll have a chance right at the beginning, but when we go into that prayer time, for you to make things right with God, and that's all important. To get the deck cleared, to clear the air, clear the space to know where you are in Christ Jesus. Amen. I want the church to remember the Satterwhite family this morning. Mr. Larry Satterwhite went home to be with the Lord this past Friday. And I'd like the church to pray for uh, his mother Martha, uh, his wife Angela, their family. Uh, that God would give them solace during this time uh, they're going through. Uh, I want the church to... Continue to remember Brother Sam Carter. Brother Sam is uh, under the weather with this flu bug. I mean, a lot of people's had the flu bug, right? And it's quite a few of them had it, and uh, he's one of them that's dealing with it, and we want to pray for his recovery. want to mention uh, Linda Salmon this morning as well. I think she has uh, caught the RSV as some kind of new respiratory 
uh, thing, and we want to pray for her healing in there as well. Um, I was talking to Brother Ralph the other day, and uh, he was telling me about Nicholas. Nicholas is a sergeant now. He's still in Marine Corps boot camp. Uh, graduate, uh, I think it's the 16th of December, is that right? And I want to continue prayers for him as God shapes him into the being and creature and the Marine he'd have him to be uh, for the use of his country's service. Let's continue to pray for him. Not to forget our pastor who's traveling today. He's out on the road. Let's remember uh, that God will give him traveling mercy as he travels back here. And let's not forget our nation today, the world leaders. You know, what's coming up Tuesday? Election, right? And I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, who not to vote for. But you know what? The, I think the fate of this country uh, lies in the hands of those who vote. So I really believe we're at a critical time and like no other in history. And only God can straighten it out. But I believe he's going to use his people to do so. And if you can, please go vote if you haven't already done so. Uh, I want to pray for a young man named William Brannock. And uh, says he needs a new kidney. And uh, he's got some other health issues, but I want to lift him up to the Lord in prayer this morning. I want you to pray when we pray for him. Uh, and then I want to pray as well for Ms. Elaine, who's preparing to go on another mission trip down to Florida. Let's pray that God would just anoint her, give her words to say as she ministers as a chaplain, I understand, down in the Fort Myers uh, area of Florida. You know, they recently had that uh, hurricane and a lot of people lost their homes and uh, lost quite a few things. We want to remember all those people. Let's keep them in prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I want you to join me as we pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that you give us an opportunity to stand here before people you've given us an opportunity to lift up these requests to you there's not one person in this building that you don't know every detail about them whether they have got a physical infirmity whether they're completely whole or whatever they are you know it heavenly father and we ask this morning lord if there's a spiritual need in anybody's life that this morning they would make sure they would come to you. They'd make sure they repented of their sins. And they'd make sure they knew you as personal Lord and Savior. We ask that this morning, Heavenly Father, that no one would leave until they made for certain that they know you that way. Father, we thank you for the requests that were mentioned this morning, dear God. We thank you for every single person, Lord God. We thank you for the praises that were mentioned, dear God. And only you can bring about an end that's so final. And only you can bring about healing, Lord God. And Lord, this morning, we ask for healing for those who need to be well. We ask for healing of spirit for those who are lost. We ask for strength for the journey. We ask for our pastor you're bringing back safely. Father, we ask this morning that during this message and singing, that dear God, somebody's heart might be moved toward you that we would become the creatures you called us to be. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Whew. God is still working. Amen. You know, one thing that we do in the youth program when we ask for prayer requests, I require them to all give me a praise. Because I tell them it's always, you know, it's fine to pray and talk to God about things that are pressed on our hearts. But we need to remember that God is good and God is still in control. Amen. And we need to look in our lives and see the positive things that God does for us so that we can see that. Because if we always look at the doom and gloom, that's all you'll ever focus on. So it's good to mention, you know, the praise reports that we had this morning. Now we're going to sing one of my favorite praise songs. I'm going to try not to hurt myself. <laughs> But if this song doesn't sum up everything that, that God is about. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The king of glory, the king above all kings. You can't say that lightly. Well, I can't say anything lightly. I'm a heavy person. But let's stand and sing. 
Praise God this morning. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is what we're here for today. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my Sing, this is amazing grace. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I No matter how hard Satan tries, as long as we're up here making a joyful noise, as long as we're up here praising our God, our God will be glorified. Satan has no place in this house this morning. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we cast him out of this place. 
And let the Holy Spirit flood our souls, flood this air, and let us, let us be moved by God. Amen. have your Bibles this morning, you can turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 9, verse 23, Luke 9, 23. Jesus spoke these words, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Every true believer of Jesus Christ wants to do the will of God. Yet most Christians think that God's will as something that is imposed on them. Some think that it's distasteful or difficult, which they are uh, enforced to do. They think that way. I believe the perfect will of God for all of us is a matter of great importance great importance because there's a vast difference between submitting ourselves to God's will and embracing it fully, embracing it fully. When we think of submitting to God's will, we subject oneself to or give in to an imposed condition. Uh, often submitting is the thought in terms of punishment or discipline. For example, the government of Iraq many years back submitted to the conditions of punishment brought about by the United Nations. The Iraqis did not embrace the imposed discipline, rather they submitted to it. Sadly, many Christians see the will of God in this way. They picture God as demanding. They give in to the hard set of rules and conditions. Do it my way or you're on your own. And I want to tell you how very wrong many are that are like that. They, they look at the Savior differently. The truth is, when a believer knows the glory of doing the Lord's perfect will, he embraces it with joy. She embraces it with joy and with hope. And to embrace means to clasp as in your arms, to press to your bosom, or an expression of love and affection. Yet the sad fact is very few embrace God's perfect will. And I sound like I've got an echo out there. Y'all hear an echo? Maybe this is me. I don't know. But anyway, okay. So perhaps you're thinking God's perfect will has passed me by. My life is a haphazard. It has no form or order to it. You can rest assured that God has an absolute, know this with everything, a perfect plan and will for every one of his children. He has a perfect plan and will for everyone sitting in this building listening to my voice this morning. He leaves no single life per chance. Uh, everybody's been playing the lottery lately. That's all on the news, right? I think it's like $1.9 billion now, and no one's won this lottery. But I want to tell you, in Jesus Christ, you're winners anyway. Whether you win a lottery or not, if you embrace the will of God, you become a winner. I was watching uh, a video the other day, and it showed Heinrich Heimel, uh, one of the Nazi leaders who was responsible for the death of so many Jewish people. And uh, he was walking with a bunch of his troops by a fence, and they were prisoners of war on the other side. And when the leaders of Germany come by, the troops that were even prisoners were supposed to dress up, put their uniform on, and stand at attention as he walked by. And this prisoner, a British soldier, was standing there with no shirt on. He was standing there with his head, and he was looking at uh, Heinrich Heimel right in the eyes. And he was daring and brave looking through that fence. But I wonder which one was in prison. Which one who had listened to propaganda 
over the years from the 1930s up until that point in the 1940s thinking that the Third Reich was going to rule the world and they were going to impose upon the whole world their religious ideas. Who was in prison? And then at the end, Heinrich Heimel took a cyanide pill and killed himself. So did Adolf Hitler when the Allied troops marched in. But his thinking was flawed. He wasn't thinking right. And uh, so, so, but God wants every order and he wants your attention so he can guide your step every day on planet earth. God wants that. Jesus wants that. And I want to tell you this morning, Jesus is God. Amen. He is God. Listen, he desires that you enter his plan and will for you today, not tomorrow. I talk to so many people and they say, it's going to be tomorrow, Pastor Short. Maybe I can get my life in order. Maybe I can do things when I get things straight. I'm going to tell you, it's likelihood that you'll never get things straight in this life. It's a likelihood that you might step out in the glory uh, and not have gotten things in order. God's beautiful will for life is not just for ministers. It's not just for those who are deeply spiritual, but for all his children. Not some, but all, friend. The New Testament exhorts that we no longer should live the rest of our life, our time uh, in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you uh, that which is well-pleasing in his sight. The early apostles had one desire for all the churches that they preached at and that every member would know God's perfect will for their lives and embrace it. Embrace it with passion. Embrace it expecting results. Embrace it that way. We ought to pray that way, expecting a, a positive outcome. Paul wrote of a brother named Ephorus, who is one of you, a servant of Christ. And he said this, he always laboring fervently for you in prayer that you may stand perfect and complete in the will of God. Colossians 4, 13. And Ephorus knew God had a perfect will for everyone in the congregation, just like this congregation. And he knew that if they would enter into the Lord's will, they would find joy. They would find ecstasy and they would have their every single need met. It's very easy for any one of us to say, yes, I want God's perfect will for my life. But the truth is, no believer enters in his will without a great struggle. God's perfect will is embraced, I believe, in a place just like Gethsemane. It's a place where we have to come to the end of ourselves realizing who God is. It was a place just like Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus set the greatest example for us we have. We cannot just simply embrace God's will until we die completely to self. Luke 9, 23, as we read earlier, and he said to, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. It was prophesied of Jesus from the very beginning that he would come to earth for one eternal purpose, and that was to fulfill the will of the Father. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the books it is written to do thy will, O God. Christ told his disciples, I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish the work in John 4, 34. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Friend, you and I were created to do the will of God. You and I were born to do the will of God. You and I were born to be one of his children if we so choose Jesus Christ. We've got to make up our mind as the people of God whether we're going to embrace it or not, whether we're going to deny ourselves and whether or not we're going to live for Christ. 
Sometimes we think that it's such a humdrum to live for Christ. It's anything but a humdrum. It gets more exciting when you follow Christ to the fullest. Life becomes richer and fuller. It's no dead beats in the family of God. It's all full of joy. Hallelujah. No matter how spiritual you are and how long you walk with Jesus, a time will come when you have to decide once and for all whose will is going to prevail in your life, whether it's yours or the Father's. Jesus Christ himself had a such an hour. He knew he had a divine, eternal call, but he was also human and he was greatly tested. No one has ever suffered like our Lord and Savior suffered. No one has ever been tempted like Jesus has been tempted. And by the way, Jesus wasn't created. He was God. Amen? He was God in the flesh. But he knew how you and I felt. He knew how you and I are. Not that he was a sinner, but he was born in the flesh. His mother was Mary. He knew what it was like to be, a, be part of this creation, being a man himself, the God-man. He knew it. So he knew what he had to do. And when the hour came for Christ, he saw before him the painful cost of embracing his Father's perfect will and what meant going into the direct jaws of death and to pain that was undescribable and unknown and he became exceedingly sorrowful even unto death in a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. I believe the battle was won in the garden. The scripture says he sweat as it were great drops of blood falling to the ground. I, I listened to a heart surgeon preaching one time. He became a preacher, this heart surgeon, uh, Mr. Cunningham. And he said, when you hear of men sweating so hard that their capillaries burst and they're sweating great drops of blood, they're having cardiac arrest. They're having heart failure. So the scripture was accurate in saying that he was sorrowful even unto death and he was sweating great drops of blood to the ground in the garden. And Jesus' very flesh began to quake. You and I are going to walk through some struggles. I wish I could tell you as a Christian, you're never not going to have another problem as long as you're a Christian, but I can't tell you that. I wish I could tell you, excuse the southern terminology, everything's going to be hunky-dory. I can't tell you that. But I can tell you this, Jesus Christ submitted himself. He embraced the will of God for you and I, and he went to a cross. Beloved, our Lord's battle at Gethsemane was all about embracing God's will, embracing it. Uh, oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will, Matthew 26, 39. And Jesus' own human will, he had to submit and embrace God's will he had a life or death struggle there. And never in the whole history of eternity past and eternity present did he ever have to think about being separated from God. But in that garden, it was coming to fruition. That night in the garden, just before his arrest, he had to make his mind up, am I going to do the will of my Father in heaven? Or am I going to call 10,000 angels to set me free and destroy the whole earth? He could have done it just by speaking one word. But he chose, listen, because he loved you and I. He chose because you are the special person in this world he loved. He chose to bear all of that struggle, bear that grief and sorrow. He chose to go to a cross, and he chose to do it. You know, when he got up off his knees in the garden, he was filled with ecstasy. He was filled with the Spirit of God, and he went to the cross with joy. Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 2 says, For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He endured the cross. Man, he endured the cross. Who in the world would want to go be beaten beyond recognition, beaten beyond a pulp, and be nailed to a cross to die for somebody who's unworthy? Who would want to do that? He did it for you and I, friend. Oh, the Lord went to the cross with complete joy. You know why? Now he can have a relationship with you. 
Those of you who embrace him fully, those of you, and he's going to be there, I can tell you that this morning. He was able to say, Father, I did not come here to live an easy life. I came to spend myself for you. Now I face the cost, and I embrace your will, Heavenly Father, to the fullest. Jesus clung to the Father's will and with an affection that lifted him beyond the sufferings that lay ahead. No man or demon could touch him, and now he eagerly anticipated the glory he would have with his Father. And I want to tell you, and the reconciliation of the world that would come about through his death, his burial and resurrection that mankind would receive because Jesus embraced the will of the Father. Thank God he did that, amen. If we're to be like Christ, we too will have our Gethsemane when faced with moving into God's perfect will. Muslims who are ever expanding in their religion on the world talk about submitting to God. And in their whole doctrine, they teach about submitting to Allah is what they say. And of course, Allah was a son God. He was not the real God. But they talk about being submissive to that. So they have to make a decision. And for a person who's a Muslim to make a decision for Jesus Christ, it means they make a decision to do away with their family, everything they have, all their ideals and everything they are. They have to give it all up for the name of Christ. I've never met one yet who's become a believer who hadn't had to walk away from their family, their ties, and everything they had because they received Jesus Christ and embraced his will. You may have testified for years, I'm here to do God's will alone. I will obey. But one day, maybe you're brought face to face with a life or death crisis beyond anything you have ever known. It's a place where choosing God's will can be painful, difficult, uh, the greatest decision you ever faced in your life. And in the end, you have three options in that. You can run. You can do nothing going the way of self-will, or you can do God's way the hard way or the way of death. You can do anything like that. The Lord's way almost looks painful. It looks hopeless, and embracing it can mean dying to all you had hoped for in this flesh. And let me give you some true life illustrations. We think about Lot and his family. But doing the will of God is different and embracing it is totally different. There was a young English girl who was called to be a missionary. She had given her heart totally to the Lord and she was full of ambition for Jesus. She led a small prayer group and worked with street people and like most girls her age she hoped to find a spiritually young man to marry as someone who would share her burden for the lost she testified to friends and to Christ that she was ready to do God's perfect will, no matter the cost. The day came when, when that desire was tested. She was a young girl, and the Holy Spirit told her to get on a boat, get on a ship, and go to the Orient. Down on her knees she went. What about a husband, Lord? A spiritual covering for my ministry. What about all the heathen over here in England who need you? What about my friends? What about the wonderful prayer meetings we've been having? Am I supposed to just take a suitcase and go? Not knowing anybody, not even knowing language? She was facing the will of God. She was facing the unknowable. She knew the Spirit had spoken and His will was clear and it was revealed to her. And she said, I'll go. He said, I'll go with you. She had a Gethsemane experience there. And before she got up from her, pray her prayers, she died to all her self-ambition. She died to self, and she lived. she's living to God. And uh, her church, her friends, to all the comfort she had, she had to say goodbye to. And but when she got up, joy filled her heart. And she got on that boat, she kissed her friends goodbye, and she crossed the line. She was willing to pay, uh, go through God's will at any cost. And see, when the boat came to Hong Kong, she got off the boat, and, and she did, not knowing a soul. 
And she's been there over 15 years. And this young lady is named Jackie Pullinger is her name, if you'd like to read about her. And she's a spiritual mother of literally hundreds of junkies and troubled people in the slums of Hong Kong. We think as Americans nobody else has any problems, but they do. Everybody has a great need, and that's the need to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. That's a fact. This lady was married to Jesus, and she was a true daughter of Zion. She knows the ecstasy of being in the perfect will of the Father, an ecstasy that will never leave her or forsake her, and it followed her once she got on the boat. There was another woman named Amanda Smith over a century ago, a woman whose heart was set on God. She was a humble black servant, and she, a prayer warrior, and people felt the presence of Jesus around her. And God sent a young woman, a wonderful, loving husband, uh, to minister with her. And Amanda was a missionary at heart, and she liked to travel. She won people to the Lord wherever they went. But then the Civil War broke out, and Amanda's husband was killed. Amanda grieved, but she continued giving herself completely to prayer and to the service of others. And eventually, though, she began to feel lonely. She began to pray, Lord, send me a godly husband, one who will share my burden to travel and minister. And one day she met a man that appeared to be all those things. And he was a Methodist lay pastor who said he uh, was going to become ordained and be a circuit rider at the time. And Amanda prayed, oh, Lord, thank you. This is the man. But Amanda did not take the matter to Gethsemane. She didn't seek the Lord for his perfect will. Deep down, she was afraid God might say no. And she wanted to marry him. And Amanda never died to her will. And her will took over. They married. And within three weeks, Amanda realized she had missed God's total will. And her husband was not a man of prayer. He had been acting just to win her heart. And then he confessed he was going to be a Dane, but he didn't. He said he knew if she wouldn't, she wouldn't marry him, if she knew he was putting on an act, and he was putting on an act the whole time just to win her hand in marriage. And eventually he left Amanda, and he backslid, and spent the rest of, she spent the rest of her life alone. But everything she did from that point on, she took to God, dying to her own will, and she was greatly blessed by herself, and the Lord led her all the days of her life, and she was used mightily as a minister of holiness. And Amanda Smith found ecstasy in the perfect will of God. If the will of God is not embraced, church, joyfully and obediently, something frightful happens. You know what happens if we don't embrace it? Hardness sets in. Uh, life loses its flavor of all becomes dead or apathetic. That is when Jesus meant when he said, Remember Lot's wife over in Luke 17, 32. Now it was God's perfect will to chasten Sodom and Gomorrah. And it was his gracious will to take Lot and his family to safety. If the angels hadn't taken them by the hand and dragged them out of that place, they would have been lost. Yet Lot's wife did not turn into a pillar of salt simply because she turned back and looked. I'm sure Lot's daughters and Lot himself and everybody was looking back at that holocaust that was going on while they were getting out of there. So what happened? Jesus was saying about Lot's wife goes a lot deeper than what you read. You see, she was angry with God. You know why she was angry with God? In her heart, she was married to her house. In her heart, she's married to her family. In her heart... She was married to her circle of friends, and God was taking it all away. She had no desire for God's perfect will, uh, which meant losing all things. And she had to get out of Sodom and Gomorrah because it's going to be burnt flat to the ground. And I can hear her saying, God's not fair. Do you hear people like that saying that? Maybe they're losing something of value to them. Maybe they're sick. Maybe it's a cancer. Maybe it's whatever it is that's taking them that way. God's not fair. Everything was going so well. And I'm sure she was saying things like, my beautiful kitchen, uh, my beautiful china, and none of these was sinful. I was a good mother. I cooked Sunday dinners. They were wonderful. Why are you taking everything away from me? 
And at that moment in her brooding anger, and I believe that's why Jesus mentioned it in Luke 17, 32, her heart was turned to stone. We know she turned into a pillow of salt, right? But her heart was turned to stone. Bitterness consumed her. Jesus was saying of her, when you are married to things and won't get out of Sodom, a hardness will set in on you. You'll be like a lifeless statue dead inside because uh, they have attached themselves to your heart. We live in a world now so full of adultery, it's uncomprehendable. We are a society that wants everything and we want it our way. I guess that's Burger King, isn't it? You can get your sandwich that way, right? We want it our way. Not only did Lot's wife miss God's will, including a new beginning with peace and purpose, but she also lost all her earthly dreams and longings. You know what happened? They went up in smoke. I was watching a documentary. and They were over at the Dead Sea outside of Israel. And as they were uh, bringing up, the, some of those divers brought up some brimstone off the bottom of the Dead Sea. And they placed the brimstone on a rock when they got back to the shore. 6,000 years that city has been destroyed. That guy took a cigarette lighter and went boop and held it to that rock. Just come off the bottom of the ocean. Been there for 6,000 years. It went woof. It blazed up again. So help me. I said, maybe God's trying to say something in that. You know what I mean? He's trying to say, we've got to embrace God's will. Doing the will of God can require walking right into the face of a fiery furnace. Isn't that something? There were three uh, Hebrew children named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were young men in the prime of their life, leaders of provinces, having authority, uh, experts in linguistics. Their goal was to bring the Hebrew laws of morality to their heathenistic society. There is no telling what dreams they shared of God's glory. And, but they were commanded by decree to worship an idol. With the rest of the people, they were warned, you have 24 hours. If you don't bow down at the sound of the trumpet, you'll be thrown in a, burn, a burning fiery furnace that was heated seven times hotter. God's will was clear to them. They could not bow down to any idol. They could only bow down to God. Yet they were three brilliant men facing death of all that they know. And of course they had options. They could have said, well, we'll bow only in our flesh, not in our hearts. They could have said that. They could have escaped. They had armed guards at uh, their command. The best Arabian horses that that area could produce. And uh, they had all the money they needed at their fingertips in the national treasury. And there were safe havens in nearby countries. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did none of those things. Instead, I believe they had an all-night prayer meeting. We got, we got prayer meeting going on this morning. Y'all know that? Jesus turned over a bunch of tables one time. And he said, you've made my father's house a den of thieves. He said, my father's house is a house of prayer. Amen. We come here to have our hearts encouraged. We come here to ask our requests of God. And we need to believe he's going to do that. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, they knew God was going to answer their prayers. There wasn't a single voice of compromise that, that night. Because they all did what Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. They embraced God's will. Oh, they, they died to their will, to all their abilities, to the future of the government, to all their godly plans. And at the moment they died that night, their hearts were filled with ecstasy. They hugged God's will, loving it. They would never let it go. They said, oh God, we'll face anything. You're able to deliver us from this burning, fiery furnace. But if you don't deliver us, we're going to serve you anyway. Even if you don't deliver us, we're going to be yours anyway. They didn't resist, and the soldiers came the next morning. They came, and they bound Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they took them to this furnace that was heated seven times hotter. And while they were taking them, they were singing praises to God because they had come into ecstasy of God's perfect will, and they knew he was going to look after them no matter what. 
And, uh, and anyway, they were cast, a lot, cast into the fiery furnace. And they were cast in there. And Nebuchadnezzar stood up immediately. He said, didn't we cast three men into that burning fiery furnace? And behold, there are four men walking around in that fire. And one is like unto the Son of God. Let me tell you something. He's in the fire. He's walking in the flame. And I want to tell you this morning, he'll be there to help you when you call upon his name. And listen, those three, three Hebrew men that were cast into the furnace, they were already dead to self, dead to ambition, dead to joy. Uh, they were dead to all these things, but they had joy in their hearts. They embraced God's will, and I'm going to tell you what, they were saved. You know what King Nebuchadnezzar did? He said, there is no God like their God. He said, anybody who doesn't worship their God, he said, their houses will be made of dung hill, and they will, it will destroy anything they had. So, so Meshach, uh, the, these three men uh, were, were there, Meshach, Abednego, and Shadrach, and God had blessed them. He delivered them. You know what the only thing was burnt on them was? The, the, the actual shackles that had them bound. Those, those knots of those ropes, it were burnt completely off. Not a hair of their head was singed in that place. Not one hair of their head. They were set free and they kept on worshiping God. What a group of men, right? I don't know if you and I are going to be cast into a fiery furnace. I hope not. Amen. I don't know what I would do if they come to a gun at my doorstep saying, okay, you're a Christian, you got to pay the price today. What would we say? Are we going to allow them to take our lives or what? A marvelous glory awaits the soul who embraces the will of God. The furnace door, I believe, represents crossing over into God's perfect will, that door. On the side of the door is armies of mocking enemies. Visions of pain and suffering, demons screaming. and But God doesn't expect this of you. He loves you. Didn't he say he would give you the desires of your heart? We're so adulterized in America, we think we got to have it all. And if we don't get it, we go to sulking before God because we don't have it. But friend, when we have God and we embrace his will, we have it all. Once we cross that line, once we make the commitment... And embrace the will of God. I believe something happens. And you know what that is? Jesus manifests himself to us. He becomes real. He becomes real to us. He manifests himself to us. While inside a fiery furnace, here he was. He didn't reveal himself to They were actually in the furnace, walking in the fire. Then Jesus shows up. Man, what a place to show up, Jesus, right? <laughs> in the midst of the fire. He was there. And uh, because they had to decide to embrace his will. And when they did embrace it, they died to self-will. Jesus manifests himself to them. What an experience it is to fall into the hands of an almighty God. What an awesome thing it is. The very moment we walk into the furnace, we cross to the other side, we embrace the Lord's will... We turn around and we'll see that Jesus is right there all the time. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know where you're at in your Christian walk. I sure hope you're right in the middle of God's perfect will for your life. But he wants you to be in that place. He wants you to be in the very place of his perfect will. He wants you to experience all you can experience. Like I said earlier... Man, it's the greatest thing in the world to be a follower of Christ. It doesn't get old. It becomes new. And look, everything becomes new. Look, our sins are forgiven. They're cast as far as the east is from the west. We are new creatures created in Christ Jesus, brand new. And he's our Lord and he's our Savior. And he's the one that leads us. You know, when we cross over and we have maybe have a Gethsemane experience, we embrace the will of God. Let me tell you what's hap going to happen. The shackles are going to come off. Your joy level is going to be full. And you're going to be willing to do the will of God. You're going to be willing to do it on earth. Listen, the, the, the prayer uh, of, you know, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth and let us do thy will as it's done on earth and in heaven as well. You know, that prayer, you think about that. 
So we need to be doing God's will here on earth. And when we do it, I can tell you this, God's going to be right there in the middle of what you're doing. He's going to be right there for you. You know, this morning, uh, we, we had a church I passed, preached at last Sunday, and uh, there were a lot of people that needed healing from whatever. There were people that had been having issues with their health. There were people that had, were having issues uh, with their relationship with God. They needed help. They needed uh, the Lord to answer their prayers. And we had a prayer time. And I'll tell you what a prayer time we had. Uh, you know, somebody said, well, prayer is private, uh, preacher. No, prayer ain't private either. Prayer is a Christian's way of communicating with God. And I'll tell you what, uh, the Bible says the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It does. And I believe in just a few minutes as we get ready to have a, a stanza or two of an invitation, you know, you may have a prayer needed. You need somebody to pray with you over, whatever it is. You may want somebody to pray with you. This preacher will be glad to pray with you and for you. Friend, I'll tell you what, we're living in a day, I believe, that we're going to have to uh, call white, white, and black, black, and we're going to have to get out of the gray area of serving God and move into the perfect light of what he would have us to do on this earth. But the only way we can meet him is in that place of prayer, in that place of surrender, in that place of doing his will, whatever it is. It may be like Elaine going to Florida, you know, stepping out on faith. Man, we're behind you 155%. It blesses my heart to hear when somebody's going to minister to others, you know. That's what the apostles did. They went, you know, like an apostle, they went. And, uh, but you know what? God's doing something. He's doing something in your life. You ain't, you're here this morning because God has spoken to your heart because God's doing something in your life. And you know what? He's doing something in your life right here at Norlina Baptist Church and through this body of believers right here in Norlina, North Carolina. Amen. We're going to have a prayer, and then we're going to have an invitational stance, a time to pray. I'll be here to pray with you, and, uh, and whatever you need might be. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word in Luke 9, 23 that tells us that we must deny ourselves and take up our cross daily and follow you. And Father, this morning, your word has come forth. Uh, those have heard your word, and we ask, Holy Spirit, that you make your word have place upon the hearts of those who heard. And dear God, we pray this morning that there's one soul here that has never made a full commitment, never really embraced your will that they would do such this morning have your way lord jesus in the midst of our congregation today let us be filled with the spirit of god and doing your will we ask it in the name of jesus we pray